Thank you. Welcome. I'm Father Mr. Pat, and welcome to Threshold of Hope program where we bring you the writings of our church, uh, especially our popes. Uh, before we get to that, I want to mention that today we celebrate St. Vincent of Saragossa in Spain. He was a deacon in the church uh, because he was a very, very bright man and had studied theology very hard. Uh, and his bishop had a speech impediment. He was the preacher. Uh, of course, the, the bishop would celebrate the Eucharist, but the deacon would preach. And in the early 300s, the last of the Roman persecutions was also the worst. Uh, it was instigated by uh, one of the generals of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. The general was instigated by his mother, who practiced witchcraft and hated Christianity very much. So uh, this last but worst of the Roman persecutions was all over the empire, including Spain. And St. Vincent was arrested along with his bishop. His bishop was uh, sent away uh, and put into exile, but Vincent was tortured and eventually executed. Uh, and he is uh, one of the uh, a number of deacon saints who are also martyrs, something that I mentioned to my producer, who has just ordained a deacon in his church uh, a week and a half ago. Um, sometimes, uh, apparently, the deacon saints are generally martyrs. Not all, but most. Uh, so I have to pay attention to that. Also, today is the 40th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision Roe versus Wade that said that uh, human life in the womb can be taken up until birth, though they, they also said that after the child has left the womb, then it should be uh, protected. But uh, up until that point, uh, life can be taken. And as a result, in that 40 years, nearly 56 million abortions that we know of have occurred since 1973. Abortion is perpetrated about every 30 seconds in the United States. Now, over the past 20 years, so half the time since Roe v. Wade, the number of abortions has been declining, and so has the number of abortion clinics. According to Operation Rescue, in 1991, <coughs> there were well over 2,000 surgical abortion clinics in America. Today, there are 600 and 63. So, you know, uh, about a third, two thirds have closed, uh, nearly 70% uh, have closed. And so that's a positive sign. Also, a lot of doctors are not learning how to do abortions because they don't enter the medical profession in order to take human life. They come to save it. And so uh, I recently was sent an article in which uh, a staunch abortion proponent was complaining about the decline of clinics and doctors willing to do it, and also complaining about any laws. For instance, uh, a minor, some laws require m girls who are uh, minors to get their parents' permission. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, most schools can't give you an aspirin without the parents' permission, but the abortionists want them to have this very risky uh, procedure to, uh, you know, at, when there's children. And so, you know, they want that repealed and many other things. And, you know, we, we see a uh, certainly, President Obama has done a number of rollbacks on executive orders limiting federal uh, complicity in abortion. He has promoted federal complicity in more abortions. Um, and 
the uh, others have as well. So we have a lot more work to do to deal with this situation and working to promote life so that people don't even want to have an abortion in the first place and then to um, do everything we can to make it as rare as possible is part of our task at hand. All right, we are going through Pope Benedict XVI's um, apostolic exhortation known as Verbum Domini, which means Word of the Lord. And you can get a copy of this at EWTN's religious catalog. Uh, and you can get a hold of the catalog by calling them at 1-800-854-6316. Or you can go to EWTNreligiouscatalog.com. That's one word, EWTNreligiouscatalog.com. And order there. And while you're there, uh, you can also take a look. Um, I believe they have or soon will have uh, uh, a new book I wrote that just came out today. And it's a, a Bible study on the Eucharist. Uh, and so you might want to ask them about that. Also, you can download a free electronic copy of Verbum Domini in the document library at our website, ew10.com. Go to where it says Faith, and then click that, and then you'll see Libraries. Click it where it till it gets to Document Library. And then when it gets there under Search, you can just type in Verbum Domini and download the document for free. And while you're at EW10.com, you can also see past Threshold of Hope programs. Uh, just click on EW10 Live Shows and then Threshold of Hope, and you've got the shows. All right. We are very much trying to encourage you to get involved and participate in our show. You can do so by coming to Birmingham uh, and being part of our live audience to ask questions and such. Secondly, you can send us your question by email by writing to threshold at ewtn.com or you can call us during this live broadcast, uh, which is Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So figure out your own time zone from there if you're uh, live right now. And uh, you can call us at 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Or you can call 205-271-2980. And we will try to answer your questions. All right, we are on paragraph 92, which is entitled, The Word of God is the Source of the Church's Mission. Now, the Synod uh, on, on Scripture uh, reaffirmed the need for a revival of a missionary consciousness. The Church needs to be conscious of its own mission from God. It says, present in the people of God from the very beginning. The first Christians saw their missionary preaching as a necessity, necessity rooted in the very nature of the faith. You know, they uh, saw that first of all, God was not some local God, typical of pagans, who saw the gods as local, and that the, you had the god of this river, the god of this ocean, the god of this mountain, and so on. That's very, very typical of pagans. Whereas Israel understood, and the church continued the same understanding, that there is only one God who created everything who is all good, and who is absolutely everywhere. There's no place to get away from him. So there's only the one God, and he is the God of every single person. Um, and that he's the one true God who revealed himself in Israel's history 
but also especially in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. And Jesus gave us the most proper response to God that, uh, you know, whom all people awaited. We all basically are hungering for God. A lot of times, uh, as St. Augustine uh, points out, we are restless until we rest in Thee. And that restlessness sometimes has a seek uh, possessions, power, uh, pleasures, and all sorts of things that seem beyond ourselves but still are too limited. Whereas what our heart really seeks is the infinity of God, something that takes us absolutely beyond ourselves and beyond any power human being can ever feel on their own, uh, through their own limits. The first Christian communities uh, did not see their faith as belonging to a particular culture. You know, they, that's very important. A lot of times you hear people talk about uh, the Western cultural tradition that includes Christianity. But that was not the perspective of the early Christians, nor has it been the perspective of the church. That's why the early Christians went to all peoples. They first went to the Jewish people because they had been given the promises of God in the Old Testament. But then they went beyond them and they went as far east as India, as St. Thomas did. They went as far northeast as northern Iraq, as uh, St. Bartholomew did. They went as far west as St. Paul seems to have gone. And others went uh, to Spain. He went, he went far west to Spain. Um, they, they, and then they kept going. After the first generation, they kept moving. They did this because they saw the faith is not part of one culture, but the faith belongs to the very essence of the truth about God and the universe. This is the most basic truth, and it concerns everybody in existence equally, not just a particular culture of a particular time. That's why St. Paul illustrates this Christian message and its fundamental universal quality. When uh, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 16 to 34, he went to Athens. He was actually running away f from um, uh, Berea and uh, Thessaloniki, where he had been persecuted, and Philippi, where he had been persecuted. And things were quiet in Athens. But he saw that they had statues of all the different gods in the main square at Athens. And then the Athenians thought, just in case we missed some god, we're going to have a shrine to the unknown god. That way we won't get the gods mad at us. See, that's part of the pagan mentality in paganism. If you don't take care of the gods, then they get angry with you and get back at you. And so um, St. Paul noticed that. And he, what he said is, what you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. In other words, they have this idea of an unknown God, but St. Paul says, I know him. And he's the God in whom you live and move and have your being. He quotes one of the statements of an ancient Greek philosopher to uh, back that up. And uh, that's why he mentions this in Acts 17, verse 23, where he says, I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And what therefore you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you. Now, the newness of the Christian uh, proclamation is something that we tell everybody. 
and Pope Benedict XVI said this to the representatives of world culture in Paris in 2008. We said, a God who is merely imagined and invented is not God at all. If he does not reveal himself, we cannot gain access to him. The novelty of Christian proclamation is that it can now say to all peoples, God has revealed himself. He personally, and now the way to him is open. The novelty of Christian proclamation does not consist in a thought, but in a deed. God has revealed himself. Now that's very important because what we've been talking about with this whole uh, exhortation by Pope Benedict is that the Christian religion is not a philosophical religion where you can argue and debate uh, on, on the basis of your own logic various thoughts about God and the world. Rather, it is a revealed religion. God reveals himself. And as such, we start with what he has revealed, and then with our own minds and insights, we build on that. That is the basis upon which we build our understanding of the world. And so, but it starts with God's revelation, and that is the word of God. And that's why it goes on in the next paragraph, 93. The word in the kingdom of God. The church's mission cannot be considered as an optional element in life or simply as something supplementary that, you know, if you, um, you know, go ahead and have a family and then you have some extra time after the kids are grown up, you can sort of supplement your Christian life by doing, being a missionary. That's not it at all. Rather, it entails letting the Holy Spirit assimilate us to Christ himself. That the Holy Spirit is given to us, God the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who inspired scripture, is given to us to make us assimilated to Christ, to become like Jesus. And therefore, the Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to share in Jesus' own mission. That's why we read in John chapter 20, verse 21, that after Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, he adds, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I send you. Now the Father sent Jesus, by the giving of the Holy Spirit, we see that at the Jordan River, which is the time when the public ministry begins. So also, Jesus on Easter Sunday night breathes on the apostles, the Holy Spirit, so that they can continue his mission. And then of course, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is given to the church as a whole, because it requires the power of the Holy Spirit to make it possible for us to go out on mission with not our own human power alone, but God's power, the power of the Holy Spirit. In that we are to share the Word of God with everything in our life. So that, for instance, I mentioned raising a family. Raising a family is not something separate from your mission to proclaim the word. As parents, you are called to proclaim the word of God to your children and to the people around you. And children will re reciprocate. They'll learn to do the same. It is the word of God itself that impels us toward our brothers and sisters it's in the Word of God that we love them. 
No, we're caught. This it's not something you can just sort of take them, come see, come sign. Doesn't matter. No, Scripture itself says that you know unless you love your brothers and sisters, you can't say that you love God. That's in First John chapter four. And uh, it's the word that illuminates and purifies and converts us. We are to conform our lives. That's why it converts us. We conform the way we live to the revelation in Scripture. And we allow Scripture to purify us and purify our activities, our inner attitudes, our virtues. And we have to realize that we are not the masters of the Word but servants of the word. And I remember um, something very remarkable to me. At the time, it was when, uh, during one of Pope John Paul's visits. And I believe it was ABC News had uh, uh, some Catholic feminist. And she was trying to make the point, now, all that that man needs to do is simply by a wave of his hand say that abortion is morally okay and it'll be okay. She understood the power of the papacy as the, the, the same way some politicians treat the Constitution. It's really whatever I make it out to be. And it's whatever a judge decides. That's what happened with Roe v. Wade. You know, the, Look in the uh, Constitution and you do not see that there is separation of church and state. You don't see that there's a, a right to privacy. As, it's not stated as such. It's derived as judges interpret the Constitution. And therefore, um, she thought of the Bible as the same way. And that the Pope is just like a politician. He can just change it if he wants. That's not what the Pope can do. He does not have authority to make Scripture whatever he wants. He is a servant of the Word of God. And he will be answerable to God himself for how he served the promotion of the truth of the Word of God. He will be judged just as any one of us will be judged. And, you know, he definitely wants to be very careful about what he does so that the judgment uh, goes in his favor. So, as a result, we need to discover ever anew the urgency and the beauty of the proclamation of the word for the coming of the kingdom of God which Jesus preached. That for, you know, you know, it's not only our actions. Um, I've heard it quoted over and over again. Preach always and use words when you have to. I've heard that said many times. Uh, and it's usually attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Um, if any of you are experts on the things that St. Francis said, I'd love to know exactly where that's from. I've never seen a direct quotation uh, of where that's from in St. Francis. But the Pope is saying, you also need to speak the words of God. Because as we've said throughout this exhortation, the sacred scripture has within itself an authority and a power that is not derived from human beings, but is derived from the fact that the Holy Spirit inspired human beings and that the Holy Spirit is the primary author of Scripture. Thus, we grow in the realization that the fathers of the church had very clear that the proclamation of the Word has the kingdom of God as its content. Right, that's, that's the purpose of the Word of God, the kingdom of God. And you, know, you see this in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, that after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God 
and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That was our Lord's first preaching. And it still needs to be the sermon that we give as well. That this is still our pro proclamation. And the fathers of the church were well aware of that. One of the fathers, uh, known as Origen, he came from Alexandria, Egypt, born in the early 180s uh, AD. Uh, Origen said Jesus is the kingdom in person. And he used the Greek word autobasileia, self-kingdom, kingdom of himself. So the very person of Jesus is the kingdom because he is the king. And we enter the kingdom of God by being in that personal relationship with Jesus Christ by which we recognize his lordship. He is the king and that he is the one we want to rule and govern and direct our lives because we are confident that Jesus Christ the King is the one who will guide us to heaven. The world, Satan, and even our own egos will redirect our steps to hell. Jesus directs us to heaven. That's why we want, we want him as Lord. The Lord offers salvation. Salvation is the forgiveness of sins and the newness of life in Jesus. And he does this in every age. It has not changed from the first century to the present. And we all should recognize, especially we Christians should recognize, how much the light of Christ needs to illumine every area of human life. I'm afraid we see a lot of darkness in our world. And we need to see how, as Pope Benedict said, in his homily for the 12th Synod of Bishops in 2008, that we all know how necessary it is to make the Word of God the center of our lives, to welcome Christ as our one Redeemer, as the kingdom of God in person, to ensure that His light may enlighten every context of humanity, from the family to the school to culture, to work, to free time, and to the other sectors of society and of our life. Now, you know, think about this. You know, it's um, very important. Um, I can remember when I went to public school in first and second grade, we read scripture, we said the Our Father, we prayed every day. In 1962, the Supreme Court made that illegal. But what has happened? The public schools have replaced Bibles with metal detectors. And those even aren't satisfactory, as we saw with a number of absolutely horrid killing of children in public schools around the country and in daycare centers. So um, we need the light of Christ in every area of life. Family is broken down through uh, all sorts of crises, like uh, divorce, but also the absence of marriage in the first place while many children are begotten. Forty percent of our children are born to unwed women, and the fathers rarely show any concern uh, for very long for their children. So we need the light of Christ everywhere. And it's not a matter of preaching a word of consolation, but rather we are also going to speak a word that disrupts the worldliness around us, disrupts many of the assumed values of our culture, and calls us to a conversion and opens the way for an encounter with Jesus Christ, an encounter with Christ that through whom 
a new humanity is able to flourish. All right, why don't we take a break and we'll come back in just a couple of minutes and we'll get your phone calls as well as questions from our audience and emails. So please stay with us. First of all, I'd like to invite you to come down here on pilgrimage. Now, I saw in the news this morning that there are some parts of the country that are extremely cold, and we're not. Uh, it's, it's cool down here, it's a little bit chilly, but it's not extremely cold. So if you um, like to get away from some of that, please do so. Uh, we'd love to have you down here in Pilgrimage, and you can contact our Pilgrimage Department by calling 205-271-2966. Or you can go to the website, www.ewtn.com. And that, uh, that's a, a very uh, good uh, thing to have you here. They'll help you with giving you the schedule of masses, uh, the programs that we, we can have you in this live audience for, and they'll uh, give you information uh, how to get to Hansville, to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, where the sisters live, and we can also get you information about places nearby to stay uh, and eat. You know, it's also good to eat. Yeah, some good eateries around here. So uh, that uh, we'd love to have you come and join us. All right, let's start off with a phone call. Hello, Bob? Yes, Father. Bob, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Father. Uh, maybe we lost Bob. Father, uh, can you hear me? I, I, I can't hear him. My question is, uh, right. on Eucharistic ministry, Oh, okay. There you are, Bob. Uh, could you repeat it? Uh, we couldn't hear you at first. Yes, my question is on Eucharistic ministry. Right. And I know that a long time ago I read the uh, uh, guidelines for it, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd like you to elaborate on it. When Eucharistic ministers should be employed, and to what extent? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, the uh, lay people are very frequently called to be extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion and to distribute the body and the blood of Christ. And one of the, uh, the, the primary situation is uh, when the congregation is large and uh, there uh, are not uh, enough priests, there might be just one priest, then uh, to help facilitate uh, the time of communion, uh, then the uh, Church of the Roman Rite allows people, uh, allows lay people to be installed as extraordinary ministers. Now, for instance, it, um, another situation would be if a priest is feeble and it would be very physically difficult for him to stand there distributing Holy Communion. Then, uh, you know, he may even sit down. Uh, I've known priests who've had, who've used wheelchairs to celebrate Mass uh, because uh, of being feeble, but, uh, or having a, a problem with their leg, maybe surgery or something. And uh, in that kind of situation, it is uh, totally acceptable for lay people to distribute communion uh, just lay people, 
because it's very difficult for the priest in a circumstance to do it. But it, uh, one concern some people have is that uh, there are folks who see this extraordinary ministry as now an ordinary ministry. Now, and the ordinary ministers of Holy Communion are first the bishop, then the priest, then the deacons. And they are supposed to do it first, you know, uh, and take their role. But if, um, again, for some reason, there are so many congregants uh, or uh, the priest is too feeble, then uh, lay uh, extraordinary ministers may be called to help with that, uh, especially at times when both the body and blood are distributed, then you'll need people to hold the chalices so that they can distribute the precious blood, uh, as well as the priest and maybe others who distribute the body of Christ. So those are the normal situations. Um, it's not legitimate for uh, the priest to just sit down and then give this over to the laity to do. No, he's still the ordinary minister. Um, but he may need help, uh, especially in some of our large parishes, and that's very legitimate. I have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Yes, I'm from uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. Great, good to have and you here. My question is uh, about the, the scripture, about the Word of mm -hmm. God. Is there a danger about studying the scripture in too technical of a way <laughs> that we begin to forget that it is the living Word of God and to treat it more just as something to be uh, uh, taken apart and dissected. Sure. You know, it's, um, you know, I, I got my doctoral studies in Scripture where I was taught to do that. You know, I was taught to um, analyze the verbal roots, be able to analyze if it was a Hebrew perfect or imperfect, which binyan it was, nifal, pa'al, and so on and do all of, of the um, different analyses by form criticism, editing criticism, and all that. And that's very useful. However, um, you know, uh, I take it this is your wife with you? Yes, that's good. And, um, you know, your relationship with her is going to be somewhat different than a lab technician's relationship with any blood specimens she might give. And in fact, uh, I, I don't take it you are a lab technician. No. So she really would not want you to analyze her blood and check her cholesterol and triglycerides and all that. No, you don't want, you don't want to check that, right? Um, and that is a very legitimate way to approach your wife, to analyze her, her blood uh, and, and any other medical uh, procedures she might need to do. But would you say that the lab technician, after having examined carefully all that's going on in your wife's blood, can you say that the lab technician therefore knows her? No, no. And you wouldn't say that he loves her. And so what the, the point of this analogy is that that task is a very useful one for certain purposes. But it's not the same as having a, a, the kind of committed relationship you have had through your marriage, which I assume has been for a number of years. And, uh, you know, we should be able to use some of the techniques of scripture scholarship in order to help understand various aspects of the text. However, that to, to do that doesn't mean, therefore, you love God more. It doesn't mean that you really understand the Bible or have come to know God through the Bible just because you can parse Hebrew verbs. It doesn't. It's, it's a useful 
tool to do what it can do. And we do use it. But to make it the be-all, end-all is as much a mistake as saying the lab technician would lay down his life for your wife. You would. The lab technician probably would not. You know, so that's, that. does that make, make sense? Use it. Use scripture scholarship. But then you, after you've done that, you approach the text with another quality of love in order to come to know God personally through the word his Holy Spirit has inspired. That help? All right, we have another call. Hello, Teresa. Hi, Father. Thank you for taking my call. Where are you from? Um, I'm, call I'm calling from New Hampshire. Oh, uh, the, as soon as you said that word, I understood that you where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and what's your question? Uh, I want, wanted to ask a question uh, perhaps you could help me with. Sure. And it's on suffering. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, have a heart condition which is genetic and it's not fixable. Yeah. And yeah. it changed my life about 10 years ago. I used mm -hmm. to be an, an, an RN and I worked with uh, cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And I have a prayer life where I say the rosary four times a day. Mm -hmm. I say the divine mercy. And I know that suffering can be a gift mm -hmm. and that God authorizes all things. Mm -hmm. So my struggle is why do I, I feel like I'm not using the suffering correctly mm -hmm. because even though I pray, I still feel anguish, sure. or I still feel mm -hmm. frustrated, right? or I still, and then when I feel that, I think, well, then I must, I'm, I'm not getting consolation, or my heart won't rest till it rests in him, so yeah. I don't know if, you know, you don't get, I guess I'm looking for is there a right way to suffer, or is everybody suffering individual? Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe I'm just kidding myself, and I'm not accepting. I don't know. So I guess I'm looking for some help there. Sure. Because this is not going to change, and I, ne I need to learn to bring it, I guess, closer to where I don't feel. Or maybe this will be my whole experience. I don't know. Well, let, let me give a couple responses. First of all, as you said, um, it's, it, it's, it's something that we can look at from the perspective of faith and see as a gift. However, as I recall many Christmases past, when I got gifts of uh, socks and clothes for Christmas, I knew it was a gift. I knew my parents gave it to me out of love, but I wanted toys. I didn't want clothes for Christmas. And so there are a lot of gifts we would rather not have. And suffering in general is one of them. You know, most of us don't like it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, that's part of the essence of suffering. If you liked it, then it would be apple pie and ice cream, but it's not. And so it's something that goes against our desires. So keep in mind that your negative reaction to suffering is perfectly normal, that you do have a sense of not liking that gift. But just as uh, the warm sweaters I accepted uh, from my parents with a disappointed look on my face when I wanted electric trains uh, was, was something very good for me, more useful than the electric trains or the toy cowboys, um, it was uh, you know, something that I had to learn to, to fit into. Because, again, mom always bought them a size bigger because uh, being a little boy, I was growing into them eventually and then beyond them. Uh, 
So, you know, this is something that we learn to grow into. And I would see that your experience of this suffering is that you have come to a certain point of realizing that I don't do the kind of nursing that was so fulfilling to me. And I was able to serve God as an RN. And you miss that. And it's not that you're missing something that would have been bad for you. That is a great service. And you prepared for that. And you can't do it. And now you also see, well, I do pray more. And you like that. But you are still in that process of growing into this gift. And be patient with yourself in the way you grow into it. My general sense of the experiences of suffering is that we understand them better in retrospect. When we are in the midst of suffering, it is difficult to understand why has God let this happen. But in retrospect, we learn to see that he was able to do things with me I never expected or dreamed of. And again, keep giving yourself that kind of time. Be patient with your own impatience. You know, learn to say, all right, you know, I don't like it. I just don't like it. Uh, and that's all right. As time goes on, a variety of other insights will come to you through it. And you'll see amazing things that God is doing as you simply stay faithful to the things that you can do in the midst of your suffering and learn that he was actually doing a lot more than you could see at that moment. So that's going to be part of this growing into the process of understanding this. Okay? All right. Keep you in our prayers too. You know, that's a very difficult thing to have heart difficulties or any other sufferings. And we'll very much keep you in our prayers. Now I have an email from Jim in Alexandria, Virginia. Dear Father Mitch, on a recent program you answered an email regarding Jesus' statement in John 10, 34, where he referred to the statement in Psalm 82, point, uh, verse 6. Is it not written in your law, I have said you are God's? And I said this in response to a question about why he called himself the Son of God. You stated that the term God's in that context referred to the judges in Exodus as representatives of God, but were not God's, literally. And the way you answered the question led to the possible conclusion that Jesus was saying he was a son of God in a figurative sense rather than the literal sense. Jesus' explanation in John 10, 34 was the only time he explained what he meant by the term Son of God. And based on your answer, the analogy Jesus used in that gospel quote, and the fact that the term Son of God was a colloquial or idiomatic expression used in Jesus' time and before, was not taken literally. It appears Jesus was not using the expression Son of God literally in reference to himself. What do you think? Well, First of all, let's take a look a little more closely at John 10. And uh, it says here um, uh, that the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus. And he asked why, uh, I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? And Jews answered him, we stone you for no good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If you called them gods, to whom the word of God came, do you say of him 
whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, the reason I wanted to read this is because in this text, Jesus is saying, look, if the scripture could call these judges gods, okay, and to, only because they had the role of judging people in God's place, then why do you object to me being called God? So it's not that he is reducing his understanding of himself as the Son of God to just a colloquialism. It's rather that he's saying, if you use the word gods for those judges who are mere human beings, then how much more authority do I have in being called Son of God? And furthermore, um, it makes it very clear in John 8, 58, and a few other places, that uh, he says, uh, for instance, before Abraham came to be, I am, where he takes the name of God, I am, and applies it to himself, claiming thereby to have the full divine nature. Okay, let's take another caller. Hello, Mary? Yes, Father. Hi, where are you from? Pennsylvania, Father. And your question? I just wanted to say I love your program, NEWTN. Thank you. Thank you. I know that. that the Vatican II okay cremation, but not mm -hmm. scattering of the ashes because right. of the resurrection, and of course our body is the vessel of the Lord. Right. I'm thinking of Bernadette of Lourdes when she almost died the first time, and she said, I hope the sister who prayed so hard is forgiven. <laughs> what, I, what I'm not clear on is power of attorney for medical, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in very serious condition. I've suffered sure. uncontrollable pain for over 12 years. God with bless my you. entire spine. Yes. And um, if you get in the shape where there is no hope, is it against our religion to withhold all life-sustaining equipment other than medications? No, as a, here would be the norm, that um, it is illegitimate to withhold food and water. Food and hydration are normal, okay? So they cannot withhold that. And um, other medications that are normal medications should not be withheld either if it would threaten life. Uh, for instance, I mean, I'm no doctor, but say aspirin. All right, you know, if, if, last, if your life depended on aspirin, they, they shouldn't withhold that. But if there is extraordinary means that uh, are used to, to keep you going, then that is not necessary. When you sign over, um, you know, power of attorney, uh, it is very legitimate to say, um, I don't want to be on a breathing machine. You know, let my body breathe naturally and then when it can't do it, I'll die, you know. Uh, you don't have to force that. Your body will, you know, breathe on its own while it can. Uh, if there's, again, no hope of real resuscitation. This happened to my grandfather. They said we he had 17 strokes on the table, but we kept reviving him. And we said, why? His body, he was 95 years old. And, um, you know, he, uh, we always told him, Josh, you're going to die of a stroke. And he did, because uh, you always used to eat fat. But he died when he was 95. You know, you can, you can let him be. You don't have to keep resuscitating him. And that's also very legitimate for us uh, at any time. Uh, you, you know, there might be refinements, some special uh, circumstances, but that would be the basic principle. What is extraordinary? means does not have to be done. Well, we are, again, out of ordinary time. And well, let me give you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, I want to remind you that this show is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between. 
your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we will be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you.